it's sort of, I guess we, we have, we'll have to answer both of those things together because we met up with Richard and he told us about, sort of gave us the gist of the book, which is a tome. Yes. And so we couldn't really read it in the time <laughs> that we had. Right. So we got, um, yeah, but so we um, got sort of uh, an in-depth idea, I think, about what the book is about and what yeah. the underlying ideas are. Because we, we, our first meeting, we had a meeting for an hour long and we typed Richard the conversation because it was quite a lot of your ideas were coming across for the first time to us so we were we were, and then we were kind of interrupt kind of talking about how we found similarities in what the cultural things Richard was talking about and kind of it started with this I suppose the first thing that we got from it as a group was the myth idea yeah, and that's yeah. what you were kind of going more into in the talk yeah that's right it started really with a painfully academic book I'd done, so 80, 100,000 words, which so it was a lot to take on. But the great thing is we, we, we had a meeting together with Andy, who produced the installation, and yeah, we talked about utopia and ideas and art and myth. The great thing was that everybody got it mm -hmm. the first time. So there were, I, I'd got no intention of saying, you've got to do this. They had no intention of saying, you've got to do this. So we brought different things together and seemed to work really well. I think myth was the thing <laughs> where we had most in yeah, common. Yeah, myth and, and the idea of like utopia not being a place, but a, a creative idea. Yeah. You were telling yeah. us about the creativity and we were kind of saying, oh, well, all our projects are, why do we do this? And you know, like you said, the yeah. thing, why do humans decorate, why do they do all these things when they don't have to? And that's kind of, that tapped into kind of every project we've ever done is a bit over the top and, you know, so we were like quite into this concept he's coming out Yeah, with. well, that's right. It's the idea of a utopia as a process, yeah. as a way of thinking, as an attitude rather than just a destination. And it you was great. We all, we all got it straight off. You mentioned the book. Is this, you're talking about your book because there's... Why, well, how kind of you to mention the book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was going to say, because we're, there's also a, a, a thinker earned block who yeah. basically hangs over this entire project as well, and that idea that you've just been described. So perhaps would you tell us yeah, okay, who yeah. he is and, right. and what, what idea of his has led to this project? Fair enough. Uh, Ernst Bloch was the guy who actually gave us our title in our hands, because it was Bloch, who's a utopian critical theorist, mm -hmm. uh, said famously, life has been put into our hands. Well, how did he get there? Bloch thought that life could and should be better than it already is. And he said that, but we've already got ideas of, of how life could be better. Let's, let's look at art, let's look at culture, let's look at theatre, painting, fairy stories, stamp collecting, circuses. And in all these things, life tends to be better or make more sense than it does in reality. And Bloch's reaction, rather than to say, well, this is, this is, terrible, this is false consciousness, this is, this is all the great deception. He said, why not? We should all, whether we're academics, artists, truck drivers, whatever it is, it is, look at these things and say, why not? So you could look at a film such as It's a Wonderful Life, which is okay, a little bit slushy, but it's hard not to have a tear in your eye at the end, no matter how many times it's in. You say, why not? Here's a community coming together, doing the right thing, putting everybody's interest before individual interest, so why not? Um, there's a great scene in, you've probably all seen it, in um, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, where Woody Allen settles an argument by producing the real Marshall McLuhan from behind the screen. And McLuhan supports Woody Allen's, Woody Allen character's point, and Woody Allen breaks all the conventions of the cinema, turns to camera and says, if only life were like this. And that's kind of the blocking approach, is if only life were like this. So it's saying the visions are there, um, the ideas are there, it's a process, it's a way of thinking, it's learning how to hope, and the arts help us do that. So that was the, that was very much the starting point, was that Ernst Bloch, who, who does, yes, he, he hovers over it, although we don't actually mention him too much in the exhibition, but he's, he's there, and he's in our title, Life mm -hmm. has been put into our house, yeah. So how does that idea, and again, you can all sort of chip in on this one, but Steph, let's start with you, how does that relate to the overall idea of utopia then that this project is celebrating? Um, you mean how does our piece relate to it? Well, let's talk about how that the idea behind the Dean Hands title, how does that relate to the overall idea? Are we talking about you know, art as 
a utopian idea, the, the use of yes, art yes. by I people mean, as... Yes, pretty much what Richard's just said, mm -hmm. no? the idea that the, the representation of, of life in the arts is always, in a sense, the, the artist's utopia, or the idea that there could be, the life could be a bit better, or things could be, um, or you want to tell the stories, you know, in the, in the stories everything is always a little bit more convenient, or a bit more, you know, people, the evil ones always get their comeuppance, or the, you know, in that sense, you, you, um, you present a utopia a lot, don't you? <laughs> and I think, uh, where, where the ideas came together is um, you started off with basically a large quantity of Indian ink and some bare walls. Yeah. So it was in our hands. If you hadn't done anything, it would still have been a bottle of ink. Well, in your case, a yeah, no, large no. container of ink yeah. uh, and some bare walls. And so yeah. the idea was that it was in our hands to, yeah. to make something out of nothing. Yeah, and Absolutely, I mean, I mean yeah. not of the stuff that you talked about when we had a meeting with you about the idea of utopia being the creative process, being this place in someone's mind, or an artist's mind, or a writer, or a musician, whoever, and how it was perfect. But then when humans tried to create utopian vision, you know, <coughs> cities or cultures or ideas, it becomes the hierarchy gets involved, or something happens that it, it doesn't, it's not utopian. Maybe life isn't perfect. Yeah. That's the, the problem. And so what we were, we were trying to do was this idea of like Richard is saying about the one of the things that was coming up was creation myth, like mm. from different cultures. Yeah, absolutely. So we were like, oh, myth, creation myth is interesting. How are we going to evolve that around something? And so we started riffing as a group, and it was like, oh, black ink is our liquid of creation. Mm -hmm. So we started then miffing, making myths mm -hmm. around that by taking influence from what Richard had talked about, which was like, uh, Native American Indian yeah. myth, uh, African myth, also. And then we take we take all these myths and cut them up in like the Dada sort of uh, technique, like William Burroughs used as well. And then we kind of create these new myths. And so, like as Richard said, we, when we got into the room, it was just a blank room, but we had made this um, what you call the big thing. I could never. An amphora. Yeah, we've, we've got someone to make <laughs> that. Vars. Yeah, the big vase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the oversized yeah. vase. And so that was the idea there was that was the vessel that held the liquid of creation. And then through all this kind of, you know, what, what we really picked up on was this idea of creating something through these modern kind of cut up myths. And but stuff. also, the idea of the liquid of creation being the potential of it, you know, so the potential for this utopia, and then mixing that up with the idea of worshiping, you know, worshiping the the gods, because you were talking about a lot of different mm -hmm. sort of gods and in, in creation myths, and so this idea of a place of worship of the potent, the creative potential, in a way, that is in, contained in the liquid of creation in mm -hmm. the anthra. Yeah. So the the source of, of particularly the the, the myth was looking at the connection between creation and creativity yeah. mm -hmm. and how creation myths, not just the ones we're probably more familiar with, but looking at uh, particularly Navajo myth, mm -hmm. was explaining how the world came to be the way it is and, and who made it and, and how does it evolve? How does it become better than it already is? So the in our hands idea was very important. But the other thing that the gun really picked out with the mythical characters mm -hmm. was the way myth works um, referencing uh, clearly by Strauss's work here. Myth is a way people make sense of the world, stories that somehow make sense of it all. Uh, you have characters representing everything, and they come together and they combine these, that they, they work out oppositions, things that don't work. Yeah. And myth brings them together and somehow, somehow makes sense. And part of the way it makes sense is the mythical characters you cause chaos, like the Navajo coyote, but also the idea, the Navajo call it Hojon, the ultimate state is one of balance and contentment and form, harmony, aesthetics, and the rest of it. So myth was a very, very important part of that. So putting it together, we were both making and sort of explaining, but in a visual rather than a verbal way. So uh, you're getting verbals tonight. <laughs> Well, we're going to come back to Lagun's mm. installation in a while. I want to talk about both, and I said inevitably because of the way that the, the two installations were put together, we'll talk about them separately, although I do want 
both of you to to chip in and comment on on either as when it's when it's relevant. We'll talk about riches first. Before we do, um, can you guys just mention because there's it's a collective. There's more people involved who aren't here tonight. So just mention the other people that are involved in the project. There's like uh, there's another member of the gun working with us, Neil Fox, but he can't be here tonight. So. There was three of us from the gun. The gun is normally seven, seven artists, uh, like five artists, illustrators, and two designers. And so we work together. Sometimes when we make the, our magazine or a bigger exhibition, we all work together. Sometimes it's the five of us. And this was down to like we call it a three-piece. We were like power, power trio, and <laughs> we kind of we, that was like the, that's the least amount of us that will work on the project. You know, because then it's not really a Le Gun thing, yeah. you know, it needs an individual. Need, yeah. And we can stare down the camera and say, hello, Neil. Hi, Nina. Hi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was supposed to be watching, but that's obviously <laughs> right now. Might later on. Um, so, Richard, we're going to talk about your installation, first of all. Mm -hmm. We've got some slides of right. the individual pieces, which we'll go through. Yeah. But just before we do, just describe in a nutshell what it is. It's not in a nutshell, but... Uh, it's, it's a big nutshell. Uh, the, my part of this was a separate room uh, adjacent. It's, it's something that puts together my ideas on the importance of form and beauty and aesthetics and harmony. Why? Because it struck me as extremely interesting that when we make something, uh, whether it's a blanket, a vase, a uh, jug, Generally speaking, rather than just worrying about its functionality, does it keep us warm, does it hold liquid, we worry, and, and artists worry, about making it look good. You worry about the shape, you worry about the colours, are you going to decorate it? Um, for instance, if the, you're part of the Amish community, you make quilts, they made quilts out of bits of leftover material, uh, which is economic and it helped kept them warm, but they went to so much trouble to make beautiful designs, to make it balancing and symmetrical, to put colours which they thought went together. And I did particular research on the Navajo, who made blankets originally for wearing, to keep warm, and then for rugs, and etc. And they went to so much trouble, they bothered so much to give it qualities which were aesthetic rather than practical. And a good question is, is why. So there's clearly something in us which, in addition to working towards the utopia which says you've got to do this and got to do that, um, there are other issues in there. Beauty, happiness, harmony. But more than that, it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. I worked a lot on weaving, the idea of weaving, uh, particularly with the Navajo, making these wonderful rugs, despite the fact that they have to work really hard with things they haven't got, like really good quality wool and water and yeah. all that and they, they put these things together from the raw materials of their environment. It's a hostile environment. They get to so much trouble. So again, it's in our hands. They get their hands to weave something which, if left to itself, would be wilderness. But by the time they finished, there are things which are of practical value, but of beauty. So I think that weaving is a metaphor for utopia. It's taking what we have and making it better. So a lot of the things I've put in my part of the exhibition are, there are three rugs, uh, a Navajo no, rug, and, and let's oh, see, the, have let's see the first rug. Well, actually, let's, the yeah, first let's start with the rug. rug. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so this is the Navajo rug. Yeah, this is a detail of a Navajo rug made in Red Mesa, Arizona from about 1910. And you can see that somebody's gone to a lot of trouble to make it more than purely functional. There's color, there's design, it's actually quite tricky. Um, those of you who know about uh, sort of weft face tapestry mm -hmm. techniques, it's very, very tricky. So um, it's hard to do. It's better than it needed to have been, yet it's practically useful. Yeah. And but it's got these qualities about it where somebody's cared to make it work. And as you mentioned, this is not like you know, someone who's bored and has got a lot of time on their hands because you know, they're rich and comfortable. They yeah. live in a harsh environment. Yeah, they've still exactly. taken the time right. to, you know, resources are scarce, they've still taken the time to make something that's beautiful yeah. as well as warm. Yeah, and which also is very much part of Navajo culture and makes sense within mm. the things we're talking about, Navajo creation mythology, where uh, creation according to Navajo mythology is a collaboration between humankind and the gods, but also is 
populated by this crazy character, the coyote, who runs around trying to bring disorder and spoil everything. And the Navajo are walking towards this idea, they call it her Jean, balance, harmony, beauty. And so it's the tension between chaos and beauty, which to me underlines myth and creativity and the aesthetic process. So what a wonderful, you know, just image which has all, all this thinking, all these ideas, just, just in... Yeah, and when, we were, when yeah. we were looking into Navajo and all these crazy myths, like the coyote, they symbolize it with a triangle, you know, it's but like the imagery there is quite similar to, you know, some of the yeah. stuff we were looking at. It's very abstract how they show things, you know, characters and stuff. So it was, it was kind of, for us, it opened up our minds to, like, you know, the Navajo, like what Richard was talking about. We would not necessarily have been looking at that before mm -hmm. we had that chat and stuff. What we're talking about, coyotes, your coyote is, um, I believe it's a coyote, there's various different representations, but he's wearing a kilt. <laughs> oh, that might be a crocodile. Oh, that's the crocodile. <laughs> that's, the cro that's the crocodile and the kilt. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, <laughs> there is a coyote in there, but I think he's naked, I think. But, yeah, I yeah. think so too. Why is the crocodile wearing a kilt? It's a Celtic spirit. It was whatever came up on the day that we were doing. But I think each one of those characters in there is like a, sh a shaman who's we've got from mm -hmm. a myth. So like the crocodile man, the spider woman, the skeleton yeah. man. They all came from these. You probably know where they came and, from. And I think also the process of the process that we use kind of reflects exactly what you were saying about the idea of balance and chaos. Because in a way, we try to create chaos by randomizing a lot of mm. the process. And then at the same time, obviously, putting it into some sort of vaguely, Order, yeah. aesthetically pleasing thing that made some sense. Mm -hmm. So creating some sort of balance with it. So although I started off particularly with Navajo, because I thought it was a great meeting of the, the theology, the mythology, and, and the visual culture, a lot of the characters, the mythical characters that you picked out, um, they populate myths from all different sort of cultures across the world. But if you stand back far enough, they start to make some sort of sense because they tend to represent mm. similar tensions and similar ideas. So mm. the Navajo are a great case study, but um, as you, you found, there are all sorts of people. And, and, and to be fair, uh, you had just a lot of fun with it as yeah, well. It Why, not? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Why not? So this is in the exhibition downstairs, yeah. but also there's a couple of... Um, rugs been made in a similar technique by artist Stella Benjamin. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, once you get close up to them, you can see that there's a lot more detail. But from, from, from a distance, they're both quite plain. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting contest, because simply talking about the fact that this has been made over elaborately, you know, mm -hmm. more than it needed to be. Yeah. Yeah, Stella Benjamin's rugs. St Stella is a wonderful textile artist uh, living and working in Cornwall. And she uses Navajo techniques, but she's not stuck to try and reproducing Navajo rugs. Mm -hmm. And if you stand back, they, they look like sort of flat color or a hint of some Mark Rothko or something mm -hmm. like that. If you get closer, you can see she's doing very, very clever things, the detail of what, what the Navajo call the lazy lines, which all start to make sense. So I thought she'd be a great person to bring in as somebody who's taking the same ideas, mm -hmm. but over 100 years later, and still making something which takes a great deal of time and trouble, the idea of metaphor, taking the raw materials of life, making them something better, but reflecting contemporary concerns. So she doesn't actually have to buy into the whole Navajo technology or design motifs to do it. And in between that, I think we've got some of the, so the other slides will help point this out. Yeah. To get from the original rug to Stella's rugs, um, we go through, well, a little bit of aesthetic theory. Well, let's uh, go on <laughs> to the next slide. Here's a, a, oh, a yeah. self-portrait of a man who is probably insulting the audience's intelligence here to ask you to tell me who Roger Fry is. But give no, no, not at all. I, excuse me, I'm just bowing and genuflecting <laughs> to the great Roger Fry. Roger Fry, um, British um, art theorist, critic, painter. He was an okay painter, um, but a brilliant critic and an outstanding theorist. And what Fry did was, in the start of the 20th century, was explain to people the importance of form over content in the arts. And at the time, he was talking particularly about post-impressionist art, because a lot of people were saying, but that's not what a proper apple or a proper wine or a proper field looks like. And he's saying, no, that's, that's not the point. We need to look at form. In other words, the way things are 
rather than what they show. So the idea of a good painting was something that, like a photograph that really looked like what it was supposed to uh, was out of the window, and he explained why. And he was able to explain this in theory, but with also with reference to art from other cultures, where, again, it was the way it was, it was the form, it's the balance, the harmony, the aesthetic elements of design, uh, which were more important. And so I started putting fry and block together, saying, well, it's a process, isn't it? It's putting things together, lining them up in a way that just somehow seems to work. And that's utopian when you think, that works better there, that works better there. Things that artists know almost mm -hmm. intuitively, but critics have to explain, particularly to a skeptical public, which is mm -hmm. saying, well, I've been to Norwich, that doesn't look like Norwich to me. <laughs> so there's far more to it. So if we look at the next, we look at the next slide, slide. Yeah, which is one of these artifacts. Yeah, this is one of the pieces um, we borrowed from the Courtauld Institute of Art. They were extremely generous with lending us things, so thank you, Courtauld. This was a, it's an African tribal dancing mask collected by Roger Fry. One of the things Fry did was say, this great thing, this idea of form, is something which is common to all good works of art, no matter which culture or when they were made. And he argued in some of his writing that African sculpture and mask actually probably had a better sense of form than many um, 20th century European North American pieces. So he put his money where his mouth was and spent a great deal of money in collecting this, this sort of thing. Um, again, we don't say, well, it doesn't look quite like a real person, does it? Uh, but he's mu much more interested in well, all the things you can see. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, this is on show at the court hall and explains how Fry got where he was, um, putting from what was at the time dismissed as primitive, but we should, he argued, I think persuasively, it was extremely sophisticated. And there's a bowl as well. Down there's, there's a bowl as well. Another, about that bowl. Yeah, the bowl was another piece Fry collected. He, he goes into raptures about its three-dimensional sophistication and all the rest of it. Oh, sorry, the bowl, there's the, there's the African bowl, the wooden one, and there's also the, the ceramic one, which yeah. is made much later. That's the one you're talking about. No, I'm talking about the ceramic. I'm talking it's about the African one, yeah. Yeah, well, the African one is, is you have to sort of walk around it to get it. Um, he does later a plate, which is Amiga Workshop. Yeah. We may not talk about that in a minute. Um, but again, it was another really good uh, example of how there was more to something than its sheer function, yeah. um, but that, that form wasn't something which was only understood by 20th century European post-impressionists, mm -hmm. that uh, anonymous sculptors in Africa had been getting this for years without, without art theory, imagine. But that doesn't mean it isn't there, because mm -hmm. it is. And so the next slide is uh, a painting of Fry's. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a, a Roger Fry um, still life. And he liked to paint in, in line with his theories. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll probably recognize this as being pretty typical of post-impressionist yeah. art. So not stunningly realistic. Um, but when we look at a painting like that, or maybe even better, still lies by Cezanne or something, we don't say, oh, what a fantastic vase. What a great candle. Or we don't even say, what a realistic. It's just like Canaletto. It's just like a photograph. We admire it because we think it's a great painting. And one of the reasons it's a great painting, or a good painting, um, is because of the trouble he's taken, again, in our hands, of taking the raw materials of everyday life, which could be a bit of drapery, a bit of, a bit, a bit of ceramic, a bit of a candle, and putting them in together in a way which makes an aesthetic and almost, almost a spiritual sense. I'm going to shy away from spiritual in a... Well, we'll come back in to another way, but uh, so this is an example of Fry at work saying yes, it's about form for modern content. In the same way, if you look at pictures of haystacks by impressionists, you don't say that is an amazing haystack. Hopefully, you say what a terrific painting, what a great way of seeing, what a great way of taking the world and turning it into something which has integrity as a work of art. As you're sitting, you're sitting here patiently listening to Richard I'm, just loving, it. I'm loving every oh, moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, you know, what does that actually mean to you when you guys have stood there, you know, collaborating on the piece with the, the Indian ink in your hand about to make something? How does that sort of translate into the actual practice? Um, <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I, th I would say it's probably relevant to, to all our practice mm. because what you're saying, what he's saying is that 
the the way you put things together is more important than um, the the realism of what you're depicting. And I think that's probably something that you like you said you do automatically because that's, that's your main concern. You yeah, know? and we're working. We've been working as a group of artists for over ten years. So when we work together, say five of us together working on something, we don't really have this discussion about you know it's <laughs> like we're going to do this. Okay, yeah. and it almost is coming together that someone does some, someone goes over something everyone's adding to everything and it's not and there's no preciousness so we like to think of it as a group consciousness it, that's what we're aiming for that it's almost like one person has made all of this but might be five people have done it and so we kind of are aware of the aesthetic and the composition and what what we're trying to do but we kind of go for it in a Quite, it's quite free, and that's why if it yeah. becomes too uh, too rigid, then it becomes with this problem to start arising with us. I was going to ask about this later on, but we might as well do it now as you've raised it. So, how did that? Is that something that had to develop, or were you, or when you started as a collective, were you sort of on the same wavelength, or is is this something that? has developed over, over various pieces of work, the fact that you can all work as like what you, what you talked about think, as one consciousness. I think it developed in the sense that we were working just together and we started making pictures together to decorate a party that we were re trying to raise some money for our magazine. And it was the cheapest way <laughs> to like decorate something with yeah. Indian ink. And then we started to think, oh, this, you could take this somewhere. So we started to work with lots of people and then gradually less and less and like we kind of, have done all sorts of scale of stuff and and then it, also taken it into 3D and yeah so 3D on. objects and but to, yeah to answer your question probably it's like a chicken and egg situation yeah. I'd imagine because I think the collective probably I mean it's come out of the magazine really but then the collective as an art collective only exists because it happened to work so well I guess um, the working together and also it's quite joyous you know it's quite like a it's very it's a very fun thing to do and this idea of um, yeah, working together on a, on a, without even needing to talk about it and without even yeah. needing to, it's like we all sort of have this vision, this, that we, like, a, like a vague vision that we all work towards, which goes back to the idea of utopia. <laughs> yeah. And I think then, this idea, yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree, this idea you've raised about, you know, do, do art, artists need art theory it is a great one. I mean, you probably all held the gag, you know, an, an artist needs art theory like a bird needs ornithology. It can still fly. Mm -hmm. um, and m maybe Roger Fry might have been a better painter if he hadn't got so much art theory. On the other hand, I mean, I know these people well enough to know that you don't work in a complete vacuum. I mean, say, Royal College of Art doesn't just say, well, here are the paints, get on with it. Um, yeah. So it's part of it. But you're, you're doing something which can't really be put entirely into words, which is why you do it. Am yeah. I right? Yeah, no, totally. And I think the thing with what we're doing comes from, like Richie said, comes from a rich background. Like, we were influenced by the 60s. Um, underground comic artists, San Francisco, Zap Comics and all this, where they were jamming together. But that comes from lots of uh, collaborative artwork where people were working together. But we, there's a lot of influences in our work, which you, when we do something, we're referencing like a classic, we sometimes reference classical paintings or photographs or, you know. So we're always looking at visual things to get ideas. It's just, we'll go to the last slide, one more slide of Richard's installation, and it brings us back to the rug, yeah, which was the first slide. But this is also, Fry, this is a, a rug, a design for a yeah. rug of the... Well, say something about what, who the Omega Group was. Okay, this, yes. this was a uh, design Fry, we're pretty sure it's Roger Fry, uh, did for the Omega Workshops, which was, again, the resonance is here, this was... A, a, sort of cooperative, mm -hmm. Fry put together in the early 1900s. And he had two missions. Firstly was to try to improve British taste and design, which had previously he thought had been terribly, terribly Victorian and dull. And he wanted people to live with things which were pleasing, but, but modern and progressive and interesting. And, uh, but that you should, that, you know, how you lived your, was, was important, which is something I think we, we'd all agree, that your, your surroundings affect how you feel. And, so 
That was part of his mission. This tied in with his welcoming of post-impressionism and French art and all the rest of it. But at the same time, through the Amiga workshops, he got a group of practicing fine artists together who, like a lot of artists, um, were quite happy of an extra income stream. And so he had a deal with them where they could work so many days a week at the Amiga workshops and get paid a daily rate. And this would provide designs for Amiga, but at the same time uh, enable the artists to get onto the work which actually they probably found a bit more interesting, mm -hmm. uh, which was their own um, painting and design. So this was a design which Fry put together, possibly in collaboration with some of the others, but I think it was, it was mostly Roger Fry. Uh, and again, working on this idea of rugs, coming back to my idea of weaving the raw materials of life, making something which is, wouldn't have been there if you hadn't bothered. Uh, but where, again, he's obviously concerned there with two things, is, is firstly making it look aesthetically pleasing and balanced by use of color and design and hatching and all those things. Uh, but secondly, it's non-representative. He doesn't think a good rug is something with a picture on it, something you recognize. And this is something which uh, the Navajo have recognized and which much, say for example, per, uh, Turkish, Iranian rugs have recognized. Uh, and uh, we, we, we can go rather with uh, Amish, again, tends not to be things put together, but it's not representative. So it brings us again together, these ideas. I like to weave ideas together. So it's bringing the Navajo, Stella ben, Benjamin, Roger Fry, art theory, myth all together <laughs> with a design for a rug, um, which is fabulous in its own right. But again, the idea is it's in our hands. We'll move on to Legon's installation, and then we have a video of it, which we'll show first of all, or a short video trailer, I guess we could describe it as. <laughs> Before we talk about what was going on there, um, you've sort of dropped little details through the conversation already, but both of you say something again about um, Ligon Collective, when it formed, and, and something about the magazine as well. Um, well we formed in sort of initially 2003 at the Royal College, and we made our first magazine in 2004. 
we've made five magazines since. It's kind of sporadic when it comes out. But we've kind of developed more into sort of an art collective than just a magazine and doing little shows. And like Steph said earlier, 3D drawing, maybe you could... Uh, yeah, so we, when the magazine, the magazine is a narrative illustration magazine, which back then didn't exist. And so it was like, the idea was that it would be a showcase for um, visual, I, I guess, for illustration, but for maybe more edgy illustration. Because at the time, the only illustration press there was really was very tedious and quite twee. And so it was like a reaction against that, more in the older spirit of maybe, um, uh, I think what, we're, what influenced us probably would be things like French satirical magazines, you know, from the turn of the 20th century, or what you said, um, sort of 60s comics, like that, and, and so on. Yeah, and sort of countercultural. Yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 there was a and kind of that DIY element but a bit more produced if that makes any sense yeah so the production is nice but then when you open it up it sort of punches you in the f you know it's sort of quite it's yeah so anyway so then for for all the um for the um launches of each issue we made an exhibition and then one of the i think the second issue as part of the exhibition we painted out an entire room in with life-size characters and then we painted the ceiling and the sort of, yeah, just everything with the help of, I think, maybe 30 people over three weeks. And we really liked the idea of this walk-in drawing and sort of pursued it and then made various 3D yeah. like we called, we called it like immersive drawing, <coughs> but maybe 3D yeah. things. And then we've kind of developed this into making a drawing and then making the object. And like kind of this weirdly links in with this thing we did at um, the v &A, which was responding to a writer's book about um, dystopian London in a thousand years in the future. And it was, we had to do this piece about remembering what a hospital was, what an ambulance was, what the NHS was, and they couldn't quite grasp what it was back then. And so we used all these elements, like, which is quite funny, like shamans and medicine men. The history of medicine was all in this piece, but it was all kind of messed up. And so, so we, we took influence from a, um, uh, what was it? It was a, a, sh a medicine man that really had pictures of, do you remember mm -hmm. where it was Oops. from? I think it was, um, I think, I can't actually remember. I think it was a Eskimo Inu Inuit, I forget which is the right word. Eskimo Inuit, it's one of them. Anyway. <laughs> so, because um, I thought it was one and then it was the other and then it was... But anyway, so it was that, and then it was a chariot, like a Roman chariot, and the whole thing was pulled by a team of urban foxes. So it was quite a maybe postmodern idea. Yeah, like myth, again myth. But it just made me think of like this and that, very similarly collected. Yeah, and this is a, a, a similar installation in the, yeah. you've already explained, you, you myth. So downstairs in the installation, there is this big amphora vase, um, um, yeah, taller than a you know, huge taller than lion, yeah. human being, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know all of the walls are painted. Um, there's also sound. So what's that? Who, who is that composed for? Uh, I made that. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, just with a Indian um, drone box. Do you know the instrument? Mm -hmm. Like they play the sitar with it. So I just twiddled. I'm not a musician, so it was just like we needed something. So I made that music. It's just loads of delay in this thing, so it's just kind of... We thought it went quite well with yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the atmosphere that we wanted to create. So. so in the video, we saw that somebody, I'm not presuming it was you guys, was, it was. dressed up <laughs> as some of the, um, the sort of mythical characters, the spider lady and the, the crocodile. Um, and you've got... They're like, they're like wands, or, yeah. or, but they're paintbrushes. Wands, that's a better. Yeah, yeah they've got like mythical <laughs> characters on them, but also, yeah, yeah. paintbrushes yeah, paint ritual tools, we thought. Which are, which are also on display down in the... And there are bottles. Yeah, the ink is the... The, the, the big vase is supposed to house the ink of creation, uh, the mm. liquid of creation. And then the little bottles have that in, and there it's kind of... It was almost like... Cause, um, King's College was saying, oh, do you want this wooded out the, the display cabinet or do you want it in there? And there was this big debate and they said it's better to keep it there. So we just incorporated 
that there were some artifacts. So it sort of relates to what Rich, you know, Absolutely, we're yeah, making yeah. like, you know, we're displaying it shows that some. It's made. Yeah, 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 and it it's just happen. yeah, and it's giving it a like. Oh, here it's being displayed in a museum setting, and it's part of this, you know, artifacts of yeah. this thing. It was great to walk in during the installation when they said, "Okay, you, you can have the room now." So I'd been busy borrowing and collecting artifacts and paintings and things together. And eventually, they said, "Oh, they're in. They're in." But be careful, there's a lot of ink about. So I sort of stuck my head around the door and there were at least three of you with ink everywhere. Um, but to see this whole thing emerging, to see it as a process emerging from blank walls and a pot of ink was fantastic. Um, so they, they, everybody's looking very respectable tonight, but at the, the time it was, it was like being in the inside of a Jackson Pollock looking at <laughs> you guys. Yeah. We can see some, yeah, of, the, some, some of, the, of the methods. So yeah, there's slides which show, so you talk as through these three slides which show the, um, the making of, putting oh, it together. Well, that's like, that one was called um, something like a hard day at the office or something, <laughs> we sort of <laughs> social media. Um, yeah, yeah, that's just maybe on the Friday when we'd thought, oh, we've got a weekend off, so we documented <laughs> we in ourselves in yeah. yeah. But you can see how it sort of came together in bits. And also there you can see more fox. Yeah, so uh, there was also another element that we didn't talk about, but it's in the film, where we, and Steph talked about earlier, about randomising this thing. So we had dice, like yes. these big toy dice, mm -hmm. and we'd written like one to six. So one is pattern, six is, uh, so I've some turn, get this book, we had this book of dreams, and we had all these things that we were kind of going, okay, if we got stuck, we'd have to throw a dice. And, so there's probably there's stuff on the floor that we were doing then. Because I think in a way we had talked about in the beginning, um, coming from, when, from, from Richard's book, that we wanted to be, we thought we would take on the guise of these shamans that would have, that would communicate the, the sort of the message, the cos cosmic messages using the liquid of creation. And in order to subvert ourselves, and just to make, that's why we randomized a lot of it, mm. to separate our own sort of ideas of, of uh, yeah, so we wouldn't overthink it. So it wouldn't so much come from us, but it would come out of the cosmos, so to speak. And we are very into the cosmic egg. We still don't really know what it is, but it keeps coming <laughs> it up keeps in, going in all of these myths. So yeah. there's a lot of these cosmic eggs in there. Well, the, perhaps the, the focus point of the, of the room is there's a, a baby which is, I mean, supposedly in utero, but it's in a brain rather than a womb. Oh, yeah, yeah, up in the womb. <laughs> You'd barely Sorry, remember it, do you? So I won't bother asking I, you. I, I was on acid when I'd done that Whether one. Whether there was any particular um, significance to that. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, did, I think we would just have to make a centralised image. Mm. And when we were like, oh, what are we going to do? And they probably yeah, had some we discussion. Have, we did have was some reasoning. I just unfortunately can't remember it, um, which is very unprofessional. But, uh. no, but, but it's, it's, it's fair, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. You do yeah. it in yeah. the same way that I've written you know, about to what extent you can explain Navajo rug making by psychoanalytic theory. Yeah. And I say, oh, yeah. Lacan says this, or Zizek says that, Freud, or something. Of course, they're not sitting there reading Zizek. They just do it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but not in a, in a naive way, mm -hmm. but just for, through a sort of cultural tradition, well, this would work, and there's a degree of spontaneity and, and drawing upon sort of cultural tropes and all the rest of it. So it doesn't have to be conscious and cerebral. And that's one of the things we're trying to yeah. put together. And, we and liked, it's all informed by myth. We liked, um, remember after the talk, um, was it interpsychic tension? Oh yeah, it was a big thing that we were yeah, we yeah. were both like, well, and Neil, we were like, what is that? Is that you kept yeah. talking. We liked some of the <laughs> language that yeah. Richard the was name coming of, out it's with. The name of my new band. <laughs> you've called your band into psychic tension. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Such a strong name. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so is there, is there, you know, some case to say that like some of those concepts mm. that were like, you know, a sort of highfalutin, you know, art criticism, end up in the work, but just because you've tried to visualize, oh, we'll try and represent that thing, even though I don't know what that means. Yeah, there's like, there's, there's going to be stuff that's leaking in from everywhere. Yeah. And there's definitely, we recorded that conversation we had with Rich, so we all listened to it. And we're like, oh, okay, this, this. <laughs> and then like, when we started cutting up 
the myths, we started to understand that a lot of cultures were saying that things happened with explosion or from the sky something happened, then it went to earth, then it went, goes to the primeval or the, you know, the underworld or the sea. And we started to realize, like, if you look at, if you went closely look at what we did, there's layers to it. So there's like the, un the underneath is like, you know, the kind of depths of the sea or the subconscious. You know, there's things in there that we kept referencing throughout all of the work. But they may just look quite play. Some of them are quite playful. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that, you know, and there's... I like the Sasquatch particularly. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's good. Yeah. Which is fair enough, because again, if you look at an abstract painting or an Amish quilt, so you don't say, what does it mean? Yeah. That's not the point. It, it is what it is. But that doesn't mean to say it doesn't have meaning. It just means it doesn't have a verbal, literal, mm. here's what it is meaning. Because if it did, well, you wouldn't bother to do it, would you? Like, there's one example in there where we, we sat in that canteen and we were just <laughs> cutting up, like, uh, these myths. And one is, like, I don't know, it said, like, the cosmic egg hatched the dark dream the most beautiful woman in a fish's, in a pike's mouth, something happened. We were like, well, this, you know, it's three lines. And we just created this thing with Kim, what's her name, Kardashian's hair, face. And then we were thinking, she's like a myth, a modern day, oh, yeah. you know. It, it was quite weird. We started to think how there are these modern, there's these people in celebrity culture that are quite, it's almost like mythical, their lives, but in the most rubbish mm -hmm. sort of way. So she she she's in there somewhere. So this kind of everything's absolutely in there. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. One of the points I was trying to make in my writing and everything we, we we've got together is the idea that everything is still mythic. We're still a mythical society. Mm -hmm. Myth isn't just um, societies from a long time ago or, or a long way away. We still think in terms of myth, whether it's Marilyn Monroe, whether it's mm. Kim Kardashian, um, symbols, yeah. figures which play out. Um, human concerns. They give us a sort of concrete representation to abstract ideas and help make sense of it. They're, they're almost like sort of puppets that do the acting out. And popular culture is still a mythical form. I mean, some of the other things I've written about, say, for instance, the Titanic, mm -hmm. historically irrelevant, mythically, a fantastic reworking of myths of hubris and nemesis, which mm -hmm. makes sense of something that didn't make sense. Oh, you tell the story, and that makes sense of it. And so, Again, if you stand back from myths around the world across time and space, you start to say, oh, these are common, common concerns turned into stories to live by. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that's the truth. Navajo creation mm -hmm. theory, Judeo-Christian, mm -hmm. Ju judeo Critean, the Bible, uh, uh, well, it's creation even like, theory, you, uh, and yet yeah, the Kardashians Yeah, and like you were saying right. earlier about <laughs> um, this one, it's a wonderful life, or this one, what is it? It's, it's a, a wonderful life. Yeah, yeah, it's like the narrative is good and evil, essentially, isn't it? And suicide yeah. and a life less lived and touched. It's quite a utopia, deep... Utopia, dystopia. Yeah, 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 like yeah. both of those, it's quite what a deep idea. Yeah. What it could be. Hmm. I mean, Harry Potter's a... We won't go, we won't go there, but talk about myth, you know. It's true, but then sure. I think maybe also that's why possibly it's a lot of Hollywood films are incredibly frustrating and boring because the, 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 the myths that they tell outdated or no longer fit or don't seem to describe the world I mean in my opinion anyway don't seem to describe the world as I understand it at all so it seems which is why we're always creating new myths exactly. because values change right right and yet we're still looking for something that makes sense of everything and so this is again going back to sort of Levi Strauss and the theory that on the one hand there are similarities going one way into similarities going the other but you stand by it, it all comes together. It's, it's this idea of threads. Mm, threads and weaving. Yeah. That's, and weaving. That was one of the <laughs> ideas that yeah. we were, you know, oh, look, there's all these things that can in, be interlinked, you know, and that's what the walls of this installation are, you know, very much. If you read the little cut ups, there'll be something about, you know, a cow chopped in half. And there's, you see on one wall, there's all this happening. We've got another one there, yeah. right? Here go. So, yeah, there's a cosmic egg there, the bait. <laughs> There's another oh, baby, yeah, isn't there? Is that the baby, or there was another one? No, there was a bigger baby. Yeah, in the brain, yeah. In the brain. We're all just admiring. Yeah, <laughs> just thinking, like, <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Is that the third slide, or the second slide? There's one more. Let's, get, let's have a look at the other, the other slide. It's quite impressive, our, our um, bit of scaffolding there as well. 
Yeah, there's someone up the scaffold. Is it you? Yeah. Is that a staff? No, it's me, I think. Oh, oh yes, I'm, I'm down there. And oh, yeah, yeah. There. Neil's asleep somewhere. Oh, yeah, that was just... That's the big joke. Yeah. That was just, yeah, to show the emperor and to scale. So we, we kind of also, we started off... Um, with the with the first meeting, then we had Neil went away. It was a common theme of Neil's going <laughs> away here, but he went away. So me and Steph had to do a drawing because we needed to have something for the holding page. So he just made that sort of the the big the big uh, vase, and then uh, Neil was out one night socialising with some people, and he met the, a handyman in a swimming pool or something. I'm going to create the myth, but I think it was in a swimming pool, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, now. yeah in, in a super basement. Are they called super basements? These, you know, people oh, like dig... Well, the... people have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They dig a big extension. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he... They tanked yeah. the building. He met, he met this guy... Like an eight-car garage on the ground. That's kind of the way Neil mixes in these circles. <laughs> so he was in this swimming pool in a super, <laughs> in a super basement, and uh, he met a handyman. And uh, he said, the guy. It really wasn't his swimming pool. Yeah, the guy said, "Look, here's my, here's my card." And he was like, "Yeah, cool." And then they had a chat, and he said, "I want, I want someone to make this giant vase." And the guy was like, "Yeah, I'll do it." And so we, we found he found this guy randomly, and then this guy just made this thing for us. Yeah, he's a genius because it had to come apart. Yeah, so it's quite complicated because it's mm. to get through doors and it had to come apart and. So it was a good chance meeting, if you believe in chance. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> it's, 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 you, we get an idea of it from the pictures. Yeah, the scale. The, the joy is, you know, encourage everybody yeah. to actually go in there because you are surrounded by it. It is, it is immersive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because it, not only the four walls, but the projections on the top. Oh, yeah, the they're sound. coming yeah. out of yeah. it as a projection. Yeah. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, the, the exhibition is on until like the 2nd of October. So if you've not seen it yet, you really should get down and see both rooms. And I think that's where we're going to have to leave it. I'm aware that we started a bit late as well, but I do want to leave a little bit of time to see if we've got any questions from the audience before we finish. So does anybody want to ask the panel anything? Anybody? One question over. Can you talk a bit more about your process of doing the dust? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, we had we had two dice and two lists. So one list, I think, just had symbols. Oh, because there was there was an edge. There's, yeah, you cut in one of the slides. There was can, a there's a board around the room, which has like a like a pattern, triangular pattern. That's the idea again of chaos and balance. Yeah. So we have this pattern, and then we had a dice for that and a list for that, and then it would say paint the next triangle painted black, paint leave it white. Uh, get what is it? Like get something no <laughs> one I think one was cosmic. Yeah, cosmic. And then pattern, one was triangle. pattern and one was triangles. And then for the other for the walls we had sort of divided them into diamond shapes. And again, to have the, the idea of the the balance of having a p underlying pattern in the chaos. And then there was it was stuff I like with was, that one. We had I think. different books. And yeah, it had like go to pick to a at. page of the dream book, and you had to kind of yeah, interpret it, something. And then just the first thing you see, you had to draw that. Or I think, we had, yeah, I forget and what it was. There was it was like referencing things we had. I'm pretty. I can't remember to tell you the truth, but uh, so the idea behind it as well was to. When we get to a certain point, we get quite tired and we get quite like, oh, you know, you're doing this, you've been doing it all day. So it was to shake it up a bit, and it was because we're constantly moving around. We're doing all these things that when we teach, we do workshops, we teach the students how to do. So we had to do it ourselves, and we were like using that process. So the, the dice was um, just to stir it up a bit. And I think it was also because that's also another connection in a way to. Um, Richard's, what Richard had told us about this, the innate, um, the innate urge to decorate things and the innate urge to, to, to want to make things, I don't know, to, in, with your hands, to sort uh -huh. of improve something. And so we wanted to keep the like, instant response to, you know, to the shape. So if we knew we had to fill a shape with something, we wanted to not overthink it or anything, but just have a direct 
follow this urge to make something. And yeah. I think this idea of, of ordering chaos is really important mm. to, to the whole thing. Uh, so the dice deliberately means you can't become too ordered. There's a, yes. great, there's a great Navajo story. Can I tell a Navajo Please story? Do. Uh, a great Navajo <laughs> story, a uh, creation story about um, they were planning how the stars were going to look. And they're laying out the design for the stars, the actual stars, on a blanket with bits of mica, which they're putting in a beautiful symmetrical pattern. And then the coyote character comes along. And the coyote character is sowing chaos and disorder. So he flips the blanket up like that. And that's why the stars are how they are, in an apparently random pattern, because he's sowed chaos and disorder. And the role of culture is then to try and recreate some sort of order out of the chaos. And that's where creativity lies. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I have a question for, uh, you know, for Professor House. Um, you know, the, I think it's interesting this whole thing about Roger Fry and how he's trying to improve the aesthetic uh, identity of Britain. And I, was, I thought maybe just offhand that maybe, you know, looking at William Morris, there was some of the same themes there. I was just curious if there was there any kind of connection and aesthetic or you know, personal opportunity. Yes, that's a very good point. William Morris and uh, that whole movement similarly were, were trying to improve British taste, uh, but to respect the idea of craftsmanship, um, the small unit as opposed to the big unit. So, so although they were working separately, it's very, you can't think of the Amiga workshops without thinking to an extent of the whole arts and crafts movement. So. Uh, so very much together. I just think that Roger Fry was, was a lot more art theoretical about it. Uh, William Morris probably more political about it. But again, if we're pulling threads together, it'll make sense. Yeah. He's I, I, too. So, sorry? He's consumer oriented too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that they both needed to to sell. Um, but if you can improve British taste at the same time, why not? Did the did the Amiga workshop do wallpaper? They. Well, the Bloomsbury's themselves did some wallpaper. They certainly did fabrics. Um, but I have to admit, the Amiga Workshop was not a great commercial success. <laughs> um, but that, that, that's an entire story for another night. <laughs> they deserve to do better. OK, well, we'll, um, we'll draw it to a close there. So this talk was supposed to be live streamed by This Is Tomorrow, but it's going to appear on the video. Oh, it was. Oh, so it did end up going out at some point. So part of this talk was live streamed, but all of it will appear um, in a couple of days on the King's website. And indeed, all of the previous uh, eight talks you can see at www.kcl.ac.uk forward slash Utopia 2016. And next Thursday, the 29th of September, is the last of 10 of these conversations, which is about curating Utopia. Um, I've been Neil Denny of Little Atoms Reddish. I forgot to say that at the beginning, which I probably should have done. Um, and finally, if you would all show your appreciation for, for Richard, Robert, and Steph, thanks all for coming. Thank you. So we. So we